one. Welcome to another episode of Progress Always. Mike Anders here with my good friend, Scott Morley, West Point grad, retired Green Beret, and leadership coach with Azimuth Leadership. And as always, we want our audience to prioritize their health and fitness by eliminating stress and creating alignment between their habits and behaviors. And all of that starts with a higher level of awareness. And Scott, what I've got the good fortune through our network and if so facto a previous interaction with the gym that we didn't uh, unpack until later on down the road in our friendship, introduced me to the stress assessment that we utilize for our clients here at Next Level, the Berkman assessment. And we now have the data, the clients that we've onboarded with said assessment and the ones that went without their ability to achieve and surpass their goals and the timeline that they do it in is exponentially faster and more efficient. And I want to dive into all of those moving pieces. But first of all, let me just express gratitude for you taking the time and fixing the technical difficulties that we had prior to this to, to come aboard and just shed some light for our audience on all things awareness and the 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 value of not just the Berkman, but just being intrinsically motivated and curious to figure these things out for yourself. So I appreciate you, man. Thanks for taking the time. No, thanks, Michael. And thank you. And thank you, Nicole. Thank the real boss uh, <laughs> for, for bringing me on today. Um, honestly, man, it's, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor. So thanks. Yeah, man, definitely. The uh, before we get into the 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 Berkman and the assessment stuff, uh, you've had quite the journey, you know, uh, special operations, Green Beret. And when uh, as your the sun was setting on your career, you're with recruiting command, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you guys were having a, a summit here in the Southwest and you needed a place to get your fitness on for about 50 or so soldiers. And somehow, some way, Next level back then, CrossFit PHX came across your radar, and you brought said 50 soldiers into headquarters, and we got our jam on. It was awesome. I got yep. this really awesome uh, plaque that, right there. That's from yep. you guys. Uh, and then it was, hey man, thanks for your help. Here, here's this plaque, token of gratitude, and uh, off we go our separate ways. It wasn't until, I don't know, four or five years later. I think three uh, or four years later. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. One, one of our clients uh, got wind of what we're doing with the, the leaders forum and on the, the, the higher level uh, offerings that we have here at Next Level. He's like, oh, dude, you got to meet this dude, Scott, formerly AKA Lieutenant Colonel Morley. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and let, let him tell you about this assessment that he has and that's brought great value to our organization and, and da, 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 da. So we sat down, we had a, a great dinner, compared notes, you know, academy to academy, Marine versus Green Beret, you know, and uh, you introduced me to the Berkman assessment, which I would later on introduce my wife into. And just that awareness for each other was so incredible because not only did it give us insight into ourselves, but also what showed up for us and what has shown up for a lot of our clients is the things that were causing us friction are also the things that we're able to now leverage for each other in our relationship and in business to bring about our best selves. So, I mean, I, not only taking the time today, but just the the impact that you've had on my ability to lead, let alone be a better husband and a father. Dude, thank you so much, man. Brother, thank, I mean, thanks for the trust. I mean, like <laughs> legitimately, I, I find this job as a, as a you know leadership coach as I get to cherry pick some of the best things that I enjoy most out of my time in uniform without the 3 a.m. calls for like the DUIs or whatever. Right. Uh, but, you know, helping people be their best and truly, I, and I think you have the tagline running on the, on the ticker below, like what actually gets us out of bed in the morning is inspiring high performers to summit even more epic objectives than they would on their own, simply through genuine leadership. And that starts, as you said, with 
self and social awareness. Mm -hmm. You, if you can bring out the best in yourself, if you know what's going to bring out the best in your teammates, be it your spouse or your work partner or a direct report, I think everybody wins. And it the the better you can do that, and the quicker you can do that, the better for all parties involved. Oh, we 100 better. I mean, just organizationally, we've 100 percent been the beneficiary of that for sure. And just bringing alignment to it all, making sure that all of our stakeholders, all of our everybody on our team, their their mission, their vision for their lives is also we're able to have a very productive conversation around is next level facilitating that need. And are you able to accomplish that? through this vehicle that is next level, right? And prior, prior to our engagement, I wasn't able to productively have that conversation, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, as you transitioned out of the uniform and into leadership coaching, I mean, we just spent the last five minutes talking about how I found the Berkman. How did the Berkman find you? Christopher F. Schmidt. So my my business partner, he was uh, uh, earlier graduate of West Point, uh, more senior Army Special Forces, a.k.a. Green Beret officer than I was, um, became a mentor of mine in uniform. And then he is the one who started Azimuth Consulting Group. Um, and he's the one who introduced me to the Berkman and what I found. The reason that I, I choose it most often to help clients is because of how like your experience, it, because of its impact on my life. I mean, a little bit of background for the audience between going through special forces assessment and selection, you go through a battery of psychological assessments. Then at, at the 10 year mark, uh, John and Jane Q taxpayer uh, allowed me the, the honor and privilege to go get my master's degree at Columbia University in social organizational psychology. As part of that program, we got another heavy dose uh, and, uh, and battery of psychological assessments so that we could understand ourselves and un could understand how to help potential future clients unpack their own strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and get the most out of themselves. So anyway, the short story long, I had been through a bunch. I'd been through a bunch in uniform. I had been through a bunch of, of psychological assessments in my master's program. And then Chris introduced me to the Berkman and it went to a depth that none of the other behavioral assessments that I personally had been privy to both in uniform and then through, through my master program. Um, and it just kind of nailed it. Mm -hmm. What, what I find interesting, I think we're going to get into it, but what I find interesting is, I think most psychological assessments assume that you're at your best and none of them really talk about what happens when you're stressed out, how irritable you can become or how anxious or nervous you can become. And what I really appreciate about the Berkman is it goes to that level and it predicts when you are acting like that, what some of those triggers are that cause it. So, and, and we can probably take it from there. No, 100%. The, what I found and, you know, having been to the Air Force Academy through officer candidate school and, you know, four years active duty in the Marine Corps and through Thunderbird, you know, Glo School of Global Management. Mm -hmm. Same, same, man. It's like, here, try, try DISC, try Myers-Briggs, try Enneagram, you know, here, it's just more awareness, more knowledge, blah, 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 you know, but it's like, what, what's the practical application of this new level of awareness, right? And at the same time, for the people that are actively seeking that information, like a clearer picture of what it looks like at your best in my opinion, stop serving you at a certain point. Cause like, okay, that's, that's what I look like at my best. How do I avoid being at my worst? And that's where I think the, the Berkman has the, the most utility when it comes to behavioral change or, and, or leveling up as a leader is where are the triggers that 
force me to that, that put me in a position where I'm expressing my stress behavior, not my usual behavior. You know, what, what are the things that make me go internal speaking, you know, Marine a little bit versus the things that, you know, allow me to express myself at my highest and best, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's where we're able to really leverage that information and put together those, those immediate action plans. Cause I think, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know it's been my experience in leadership where delegation is a learned behavior. It's not necessarily something that's innate to most leaders because it's a lot of the reason you're a leader in the first place is because you're used to just doing shit yourself. Right. <laughs> yep. So, and then when it comes to the, the, the conscious effort of delegation, you feel guilty in that act because now you're like, Oh, you know, the ego starts chirping. It's like, Oh, you're, you're admitting that you can't do it all by yourself. You have to, you know, ask for help that's these are, these are all things in very naive leadership that we are told are weak points yep. right versus you know further on down the line higher more aware leaders understand the concept of command and control and sometimes i got to be in the front sometimes i got to be in the back sometimes i got to be in the mix dead center but where, wherever I need to be to move the mission forward is where I need to be. And there's a lot of movement required to establish that, right? So, you know, as you've transitioned away from active duty and into leadership coaching, where is that fine line between being to military in application and taking into consideration the, the nuance of the corporate world and small business? Good, good question. I think the first answer that comes to mind is simply kindness. Hmm. And I, I don't think you'd, you'd hear, uh, or I guess I, I don't think many people would assume that you'd hear you know, a retired Green Beret talk about kindness, but mm -hmm. I think that is a fundamental part of how uh, we coach at Azimuth Leadership is starting with kindness, assuming positive intent of your teammate, of your spouse, of your boss, of your peer, whoever. Mm -hmm. Because if you start with kindness and you assume positive intent, um, I think no matter if you're in uniform or out, you can start to empathize a little bit and start. You can even give really bad news, but if you're doing it with good intent and you're mm -hmm. doing it with kindness, you can get to the same end state without being an asshole. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, so absolutely. I, I, I think I think starting with kindness um, is a great way to take some of the i guess perceived military off um and frankly model the kind of kindness as a coach that we would want a lot of our executive clients to embody with their own teams sure and yeah you know, i want to dive a little bit deeper cuz <clears throat> you know we've had that extensive arsenal of personality tests and and strength finders and all those things in in our respective backgrounds and from a utilization standpoint i'm curious in your opinion uh you've answered it thirty thousand feet but i want to get deep what sets the berkman apart from you know insert personality assessment here Good question. I, I answer that often to my clients. Well, so I'll, I'll use the same explanation that I use with my own clients. Based on that whole battery that I described personally, both going through assessment selection to special operations and then and then during my master's program at Columbia, um, what I know now is that the Berkman, first and foremost, I think is one of the, one of the two uh, if not one of the top two uh, most valid and reliable scientifically. 
okay. available bar none. I think I personally think that the since you're asking my personal opinion, I don't have yeah. exact I don't have I don't have hard data to back up what I'm saying. Um, but I've I have i have i have done enough to, to be dangerous. So I think the Berkman and another one called the Hogan are mm-hmm. two of the most, if not the two most rely scientifically and psychologically valid and reliable available. Why? So Roger Berkman was a bomber pilot in World War II. As he and his bombing crew were going over occupied France and over Germany, they'd come back and they do their post-operations debrief. And Berkman found it fascinating that on this shared experience, every single man at the time, that's not being gender uh, you know, limiting, that at the time there were only men in those bomber aircraft. Um the men in his aircraft all saw a completely different perspective over the shared experience. Number one, number two, they all reacted to the stresses of those operations completely differently. One might be calm, cool, and collected. One might be yelling. One might be in the fetal position, scared, right? Like they all, I mean, that's war. I mean, like, Mm -hmm. so all those, all those stress reactions were different. So after victory day happens in Europe, Berkman comes back to the United States and enrolls at the University of Texas at Austin and gets his doctorate in psychology. His doctoral thesis and his doctoral research is what gave birth to what we now know as the Berkman method. Uh, I believe he published in 1953. So now that we're talking in 2023, it's exactly 70 years old. So now you have with the Berkman, you have 70 years of longitudinal data and over 5 million people have taken the assessment. So you have a depth of sample size and a longitudinal sample size to run all of the statistical analysis on threats to validity and internal or external bias, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they've run all the traps. um, And what they found is that the Berkman uh, holds up over time much better than most other assessments available. Unless you've gone specifically through trauma or loss, personally that had that that has led to a grieving period if you've gone through deep personal grief then some of your berkman cha- scores will change statistically significantly if not they typically don't change maybe a number here or there but not significant enough to really change the the outcome of your report most of the other assessments out there can't purport that yep. they, that that if if i mean if you take fill in the blank name uh, after a time or two taking it, you can kind of start gaming the test and get the, get the score you want. Um, the questions on the Berkman, I think are screened so well that it's really hard to game the test in that way. Um, and what they've shown is even when you have taken multiple times, typically your scores don't change unless you've gone through that personal grief. So I think Fair with enough. 70 years of data and the depth of the sample size, the reliability and the validity is what sets it apart. There's the short answer. Yeah, no, love it. Shit. Um, so with that, uh, Berkman aside, like why why is it important as just a human being, let alone an executive athlete as we serve or a, a, an executive leader as you serve? Why is this higher level of awareness so critical to showing up in the world at your highest and best? Self-awareness, I think, is key to to not only bring out the best in yourself, but also know your own limitations and not feel bad about some of that delegation. If it's not going to bring me energy, if it's not good, if it's going to trigger one of my stress behaviors, then why would I sign up for it willingly? Those are some of those tasks that you can delegate and not feel bad about it. If you if you, I think a lot of us because of those same ego chirps that you were talking about earlier, right? Oh, yeah. We, we, we start, well, I should be able to do this. As a coach, I I now, but why? why? Why not delegate it? Why not give that to your spouse? Ask your spouse to take up that. If, she, if he or she loves it, you're giving them a gift, and it's taking work that sucks the life out of you off of your plate. Who loses in that scenario? Right? So... Um, I, the, I think, I think self-awareness is paramount. In fact, at, at Azimuth, we kind of use a three major building block methodology, perspective, action, and commitment. 
Mm -hmm. Everything starts with taking stock of where you are personally and professionally and who you are personally and professionally before you start putting like a detailed developmental plan and putting that into action and then committing to it. It starts, everything is fundamental. And I frankly, uh, my own purview of, of leadership writ large, no matter what industry or whether it's military, private sector, nonprofit, whatever, leadership yeah. starts with self-awareness. It is yep. the fundamental building block of effective leadership is knowing thyself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, when it comes to the leverage, right, I feel like somebody who's naive to this conversation or doesn't operate at <clears throat> this frequency, I stopped using the word level, but doesn't operate at this frequency, uh, has such a, a negative connotation when the reality of it is everything that we do in life in terms of showing up as the best version of ourselves has everything to do with leverage, right? Leverage in the sense of these are the things I'm going to take off my plate and just stop doing. These are the things that I need to be doing more of. And these are the things that are essential to making that happen that I just don't need to be doing, right? It kind of falls into those three buckets. And I think it's that, that part in the middle, the things that need to happen that I don't need to be doing where we get caught in that ego trap. Right. Especially 100%. when we give ourselves that label or by role and or title, we are given that label of leader. It's like to your what you said earlier, I'm supposed to be able to do that. It's like, no, no, there's a huge difference between responsibility and accountability. I'm responsible for everything. That I happens not, or fails to happen. Yep. That, that's correct. I am not accountable for the things that have been delegated. Right. And I want, I want to explore that concept with you and get your take on how you drive that message home for leaders. Because once you have the awareness, right. What we, what we do on a per component basis is put together an immediate action plan. Here's the trigger. We want to create a big enough gap between your normal, you know, that trigger and your normal response so that you can make a different and better decision. Yep. Right. So what, how do you, how do you go about doing that uh, from your perspective? So if I may, I'm going to take the opportunity to kind of explain to the audience who's, who is not familiar with the Berkman, kind of the, the, the fundamental of the Berkman, if I, yes. if I may, to answer that Please. question. So for those unfamiliar, the Berkman st starts with three fundamental uh, levels of nine different behavioral components. So it starts with your need. What are your subconscious? And this is the part that differentiates the Berkman from all except the Hogan that I've, that I've personally been privy to starts with your subconscious expectations on how the world is supposed to work. And, and, and the Berkman speak, they call those your needs. So once I, once I can first understand the way I subconsciously feel the world should be working, that's hidden. That's in your subconscious. No one else can see what those expectations are. And so the better you can understand what those actual expectations of how the world should work, about yourself, then next step is then you can articulate to your partners what those expectations actually are. Well, so I want to back. Start. I want. I want. I want to back up real quick because, yep. and I don't. I don't want to lose the track. So we're at level one, creating awareness around your needs and expectations. I think what's also important about the subconscious element of that is a lot of us, myself included, coming into this experience. There's a lot of shit you, you didn't even know were your expectations and needs. So how the hell are you supposed to articulate them without bringing it to the surface first? Can't. Can't. Super hard, right? And you and I can, you and I can probably compare notes. And we may, and I'd, love, I'd love to. I use myself as interest in it quite a bit. Like, I mean, I was screwing up last year. Uh, and it, it took me going back to my own Berkman even though I'm coaching people all day long using it, I had to go back to my own Berkman to figure out why my wife said that I was being a serious jerk to her and the kids. Right. And I had to go, Oh, wait a minute. Time out. Like I need to go figure this out. So 
Uh, okay, so with those needs, Berkman speak, either those are met, those expectations are met, or they're not met. When mm. they are met, that's when you exhibit your usual behavior. Those are your top strengths, as many other behavioral assessments would identify them. When they are not met, and this is what another differentiator on the Berkman, when they're not met, the Berkman will also predict what some of those stress behaviors look like. What you have to remember is as, as a uh, participant in the Berkman process is that the people around you can see your stress behavior or they can see your usual behavior. They can't understand why you're acting one way or another. Mm -hmm. until they understand what expectations they are or are not meeting or, right. or the environment is or is not meeting. So it starts there. And to your point, the better you can understand thyself, the better you can articulate thyself to the people who are in your inner circle and are who are with you day in and day out, 24-7, 365. Now, beyond that, there's also 10 interest in Berkman speak to go over where do you get your energy from? And so what, what we do in Azimuth, and I think what you do at Next Level is similar. Let's figure, let's first figure out where your sources of energy are coming from. For me, it was serving in uniform. It was, it was social service and giving back to a greater good. Even, even while I'm coaching, uh, I need more. And so I do a lot of volunteer work on the side pro bono, no cash, coach youth sports, help with service academy admissions, help congressional panels for service academy nominations, blah, 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 blah. Yep. Uh, simply to get that energy that I, that I used to get in uniform, but I get that now in other capacities. Yep. Um, but understanding where, so being a nerd, scientific is one of them, right? And I, mm -hmm. I just like nerding out and being curious. Um, my wife and I will use road trips to just listen to audiobooks or learn some, some whoever author, uh, you know, teaching us, educating us on, on concepts we never previously considered, etc. Whatever, but figure out where you get those sources of energy from and where those drainers of energy are for you mm -hmm. is the start point, I think. Okay, now I know where I can put nitrous into my engine and get more horsepower out of the same infrastructure. Yep. Right. Then if you're thinking about, okay, when I'm at my best, if I'm doing the things that I actually really, really get motivated and stoked by the more I can build those into my personal and or professional rhythms and yep. daily and weekly habits, the more energy you're going to get, the more I can divest myself of the things that drain energy from me. Better for me. Typically going to get a more energized, more positive partner for your, again, spouse, work colleague, direct report, whomever. Yep. And, and then, then you go to those component behaviors where you identify, okay, what are my actual expectations? Like you and I have experienced yep. a lot of times you don't even know that stuff. I mm -hmm. had no idea that I was actually an introvert until I was out of uniform. Dude. And all this. And it it is a trigger hard for me, not, mm -hmm. and I would never have done it uh, had I not identified it through this process. So I can get up for like a podcast, yep. but I probably might take a nap afterwards, right? Because like once <laughs> I've been up, uh, yep. but knowing, knowing yourself, just knowing some of those triggers so that you can deconstruct it. Well, when you're stressed, what, what expectations not being met? so that I can re-engineer it and become my best partner and best self for those around me. Quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that's, that's a long answer to say, starting with that self-awareness, understanding where your sources of energy are and are not, mm -hmm. and make it okay to delegate partner. Those things yep. that are going to drain your energy. It's okay to ask for permission to do more of those things that bring you energy and then understand where those triggers are so that you can engineer uh, the best possible environment to bring out your best self more frequently and more often for your organization, team, marriage. Yep. Whatever. 
Yeah, it's it's interesting because there there's a couple of dynamics at play here when it comes to the the components, right? And I what I what I also thoroughly enjoy about the Berkman conversation is the exploration of our blind spots, right? Mm -hmm. Not not just simply uh, the acknowledgement of what we look like in our stress and how we show up at our best and what those expectations are, but also creating that uh, a, a higher degree of awareness in that in some respects in your stress compared to your usual behavior using a lot of Berkman speak here, uh, they can be polar opposites, right? You can show up as an extrovert and as soon as that, that stress shows up, you withdraw and become a hermit and you're antisocial as fuck. Irritable. Right? Yep. The other side of that, the opposite end of that spectrum is uh, you have this uncanny work capacity where you can just sit and do for a longer than usual period of time. And when that stress shows up, if that's you at 10, it becomes you at 15. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's or zero in my case. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. So being able to show people like, and this this is what this has been extremely helpful for our clients and helping them with the the mitigation the elimination of stress it's like oh shit the whole, the entire reason i have 8000 emails that i haven't touched it, the that sense of overwhelm that i'm feeling has nothing to do with the fact that the number is 8000 and it has everything to do with the fact that I have a low administrative score and the, the idea of sitting at the computer, crump, my energy comes crumbling down. Why would I want to do that when I could go be face-to-face -face with my team, my clients, whoever, right? So great guidance for that person is you need an assistant. You need somebody to delegate that shit to, that, that gatekeeper, and that all of a sudden that you know where they would be resistant to that kind of hire mm -hmm. right it become that would be person becomes an asset not a liability right and now we're able to navigate things so much more productively because this we're we're talking to your point you know the there's the depth and the breadth of reliability as far as the Berkman is concerned, where we can help guide our clients into making those calls so that they can continue to show up as their highest and best self. Yep. I, I, got, I, I have a great example firsthand. We went through this uh, with a, with a well-known company um, last year and we did a small pilot program first and then expanded to a larger team within it. Um, and it was it, on your point, we had two members who previously kind of drove each other nuts and they mm -hmm. were always kind of rubbing heads because their approaches were vastly different than one another. And after going through the Berkman, they, they realized, so I'll just, without naming names, um, but one was super interested in selling, like his persuasion interest was super high, but his literary and administrative scores were single digits. Like, yeah, would just suck the life out of him anytime he had to do it. Conversely, the man who thought he was crazy and, and who he thought was crazy was 90th, 99th percentile on literary mm. and single digits on persuasion. And so after I love this story because it's I think it's a great anecdotal reference on how do you how you could use this towards mm -hmm. the forces of good in your own team is once you could put a, a name to it. Those two gentlemen didn't no longer saw each other as weird. They saw each mm -hmm. other as points of leverage for one another. Yes. And now you've got two teammates who, hey man, I I think I had this concept that could work, but I don't want to write up the concept. I don't want to create the PowerPoint. I don't want to do, I don't want to create the the product or the data to go into it. I have I know it intuitively, 
And the high literary score gentleman said, give it to me. I love that stuff. Yep. He, he takes all the, all the nug work off the, let's call it persuasion person's plate, does all the nug work on it, flips it over to the salesman, to the pers- guy who loves selling and, and building the bench. And they now became one of the most effective partners in the entire organization. They just yep. kept partnering and partnering and partnering where one would do all the deep work, one would do the sales pitch and the and the skid greasing, and all of a sudden you've got momentum. Yep. Using it towards your earlier point, using each other as leverage, no longer seeing each other as different. Yeah. One of my yep. favorite quotes about the Berkman, I think you, you know it too, is we can tr- we 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 it's easy to connect with people wh- who are similar to us. Mm-hmm. It's easier to build rapport where there's common ground but you actually contribute where you're different. And yes. if you can if you can see that as a positive more than that person's weird, I don't understand her her perspective, whatever. If it's like, wait a minute, let me ask a couple questions cuz maybe that that person can do what I don't want to do, maybe I can do what they don't want to do and, and and we get more together than we do apart. Yeah. Uh, and you know, to that point where it's really served our team is it's it's allowed us to engage more readily in the good to great conversation. Yeah. Right. We're not talking about like the the mediocre walk on eggshells. I want to protect your feelings type narrative anymore. Because now that we have this this level of where awareness both as individuals and about the team when somebody is asked and or tasked with a certain thing, it's like uh, it, it's no longer perceived or allowed to be perceived as the the shunting of workload. It's like, no, this is going to allow you to express your genius that much further. Yeah. Right. Whereas it would just sit on the shelf and go by the wayside if I was to take it on, if we were to give it to another teammate, right? So the, it, you know, to, to leverage each other's strengths, it makes it so much more of a productive conversation and so much less of uh, when you look at perceived opportunities, right? And I'm sure you, you've, you've delved into this and I know that I have as well when we start to play at the organizational level, it was like, well, why does so-and-so get all these opportunities and blah, blah, you know, it's like, well, those opportunities for person A would be obstacles for person B. 100%. Yep. And that doesn't, that doesn't serve where we're going, you know, and, just be, and be able to put, to put names and labels on that stuff. Like it's not Michael's a weirdo. It's, right. Michael's better. He he gets more energy out of X activity than I do. Mm-hmm. So let him do it. Yeah. Let me let me go bang away on an Excel spreadsheet. That's not me, by the way. That's my wife. But <laughs> but like you know, like example, like let let me take the administrative work off because I actually enjoy formatting and sorting and making pivot tables on Excel. Michael doesn't. Right. But let Michael go be the face of next level. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do that. I don't like the spotlight that much. I don't like to persuade that much, but I don't mind doing the backside support. Michael's thinking the exact same thing. Michael's thinking, well, I don't want to do that stuff. Right. I don't, I don't want to do the backside support stuff. I want to, mm-hmm. I want to dream big. I want to create networks. I want to create opportunities for my clients, et cetera. Yeah. So I think, I think the more you can, again, be aware of yourself, and be aware of what's going to bring out the best in your teammates, the better for any partnership. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's been super fruitful when it comes to the, the making yourself a priority piece of what we do, because with this level of awareness, understanding the triggers of your stress and being able to put together that immediate action plan on the back end of that awareness it's freed our, our clients up to adopt and integrate behaviors that would have stupefied them in the past. Yeah. Right. Where they're 
expression of stress, if we're talking, you know, the health and fitness end of the spectrum here would be to, you know, uh, eat that gallon of ice cream or, uh, uh, avoid purposely single ingredient foods and just continue to exacerbate this inflammatory state that they're in, right? Once we create that alignment between, oh, wait a minute. If I make this decision, th it, this decision that I'm that I would normally make under these circumstances does not support my aspirational self or my highest and best use. Just having that thought puts a big enough gap between the trigger and what they would have usually done in that stress behavior. Yep. In that stress behavior to do something different. Mm -hmm. And I've not seen that application used in any other assessment that I've done. Me neither. You know, and I'm, I'm curious as far as what this is, what this level of awareness has done for you relationally beyond your, the professional acumen that it, it obviously, and you know, most, uh, people are most familiar with the professional application of these things. What's it done for you with regards to uh, your relationship with your, your wife and kids as a husband and a father? Uh, I, great question. And yeah, not only am I a, you know, a coach, but I'm also a client. Of the person, <laughs> right? uh, I mean, the the story I tell most because I, I believe that as a coach sharing some of these stories is actually important. So I think this is a great question. So last year, I was very fortunate to, to have a, a pretty robust client load. So I was on Zoom from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., usually without a break. Mm -hmm. Bang, 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 bang. Hour-long call. All right, hang up. Get on with the next client. Talk through. Uh, and so, you know, when you back that up to – but I had to get kids ready for school before that. I had to get my own personal fitness in. So I wouldn't go stir crazy, my own mental health. Right? Yeah. So I was getting up at say 4.30 in the morning, 4, 4, 4 35 o'clock in the morning every day. Do my workout, get home, get the kids ready for school and then shower, shave. And I'm on, on screen, on camera by 8 a.m. Yeah. Coach to five. Now I've got two kids under the age of 12 that I've got to get ready for sports practice. It's now five o'clock. We're all working from home. I opened my office door. I so said I no longer have that commute that I used to have driving to and from the office. This may resonate with some of your audience, right? <laughs> so now I open the door and now I've got two kids who immediately need my time, attention, and most importantly, my empathy. Yes. And so I get them ready for sports because I, I knew that I loved giving back. I was then coaching a youth lacrosse team in Southern Phoenix, down in Ahwatukee. And uh, so I was, I was an assistant coach down there. So then I was coaching 10 to 12, 10 year old boys for two hours, eight o'clock, my get home, send my boy to the shower. I'm now the first time my wife had, I hadn't had a chance to talk all day. So she needs to, and she's a verbal processor, right? Her Bergman mm -hmm. would predict that she needs to verbally <laughs> process her day. Um, and so, you know, here it is nine o'clock. I've been with people all day long. And for our entire marriage, for 13 years of marriage at that point, uh, we would always go to bed at the exact same time. We'd go to bed together, wake up at the same time, rinse and repeat. Well, I was on that cycle from January to April. And right around mid-April, my wife came to me and she goes, Scott, you were seriously being a jerk to me and the kids. Like something's got to change because your behavior is not okay. And I was like, mm -hmm. that hurt, that hurt, that hurt to hear. Yeah. And uh, so using my own Berkman against myself, right. I went back to, I, I was like, all right, I do this for a living. So I better be able to figure this out for myself. So I went to my Berkman. I said, okay, that's a stress behavior. And I went through my Berkman. I said, okay, why am I becoming irritable? to my wife and my kids. First of all, they're safe. They're the safe place where I can be my most genuine self. 
Mm-hmm. So I can let my guard down and let some of the more ugly behaviors come out. And then I realize, okay, I don't have a break at all. And as you alluded to earlier, I show up super duper extroverted, but my needs and my expectations are way deep down in the dark blue of the Berkman introvert. Mm-hmm. If I don't get that, my Berkman predicts that I'm going to get super irritable if I have too much people time. I used to have, you know, the term TDY trips, temporary duty trips yep. to go sit in a hotel room when I'm not with people. I have commutes, I'd have plane rides, and now I'm just working from home and I've got, you know, an inch and a quarter deep wood door between me and the rest of the world is as much yep. as I got. <laughs> so anyway, short story long. Uh, I went back to my Berkman. I was like, okay, I think it's this social energy as one of the components of the Berkman. I said, okay, I think this is it. And then so I went back to my wife and I said, hon, I want to try something. I think this is my social energy stress behavior coming out. And I said those words because she had been through the Berkman at that point. Yep. And I, I said, I think is so I want to try something new. I don't think you're going to like it because her love languages are physical touch and quality time. Us not going to bed together is a violation of both of those love languages. <laughs> right? I said, hey, you know, I want to try to stay up a little bit longer than you at night. I would need, I need just I want an hour, hour and a half, just sit on the couch, watch a movie that I've seen a thousand times and just not talk to anybody at the end of the day. She gave me the stank eyes. She's like, oh, I don't know about this, bro. And I'm like, can, can we just try? So she agreed. We tried it for two months. I circled back in June. I said, okay, check in time. How's it going? Mm -hmm. She reluctantly said, well, I don't love this, Mm -hmm. but I got to admit that you're way more patient and kind to kids and to me. So I think revert having this to to your point, like where you can use this, the, the Berkman doesn't only work professionally. Yeah. And sh- I don't think should work only professionally. I mm-hmm. think it does a good job as a holistic uh, assessment to provide you perspective of where you are and who you are so that yep. you can bring out your best self more often and bring out the best self with that understanding like, oh, my partner, my boss, my peer, my direct report, they're stressing out. There's an expectation unmet. Let me figure out what expectations not being met so that I can meet it and then bring out their best self. Yeah. The communication part, man. I think that it it unlocks a level of communication that, you know, in a lot of cases was previously non-existent. Yep. You know, uh, whether it's I didn't know I could talk to you about that. Or more often we experience the narrative of, I didn't know that I needed to express that, you know, yep. uh, Nicole About and myself. I, yeah, 100%. I mean, yep. Nicole and I, perfect example. Uh, Nicole and I had a, uh, break glass in case of emergency. Like if we don't fix this right here, right now, like something bad is going to happen inside of our marriage. Right. And what showed up as a result of, like one, that recognition, like an expectation is obviously not being met, right? And where I speak who, being that communicator green, right? And she speaks what, being that doer red, right? Uh, A lot of times we get wires crossed because we just, we don't speak the same language in that sense, in terms of where our priorities are. You know what I'm saying? So we have to, we constantly check in, like, are, are we saying the same thing, you know? And if we are, it's really cool to just let shit die, you know? It's like, cool. You heard it. You heard it the way you needed to hear it. I understood it the way I needed to understand it. And we can press forward. No harm, no foul. All good. This was not one of those instances. <laughs> and what showed up again, coming back to this, I didn't know I needed to say that shit out loud was she needed to hear that she was included her vision and my vision were in alignment and those two things were included in my big picture because i only talk about the end right 
being the, the visionary individual that I am, it's like at the end, when the sun sets on everything, this is what Michael's doing. And what she's not hearing is, well, what about us? What about me and the kids? Right? And in my internal dialogue, it's like, well, in order for me to get there, like all these other things have to happen. Like it's, it's baked in. Like you take it as a given. It's yeah. implied. Yeah, exactly. That, that is not a variable. It's a given. Right. <laughs> and, but then again, you know, once, once the issue was resolved, like we put all the pieces back together, no glass balls were dropped. Right. My default now is I come back to the Berkman and it's like, okay, where, where, where did I fuck this up? What, how do, how do I not do this again? Right. And it, it's plain as day right there, like beyond the five love languages, like Michael, she needs to hear it out loud. Like all the things that, all the things that you've already worked out in your mind. And it's like, this is the result of all of that. And that's the only thing that comes out of your mouth. I, this is a learned behavior, right? It, I need to take a step back be more patient and walk, walk it, walk the line, right? Walk, walk the logic on, yeah. on what, on the intermediary steps that get you to that big dream mm -hmm. that do include Nicole and the kids. Did right. I hear that right? Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And like that, that awareness and being okay with that introspection because a, a, a lesser aware version of Michael would have been very adverse to even taking a look at that in this way. Like, I just don't understand what you don't get would be my natural response in a previous season of my life, as opposed to, okay, I understand that there's friction. Let's, let's take, I, I need to hear it. And now we're going to start, we're going to do the work to get through it. Mm -hmm. Right. And the, that um, uh, that honest conflict, you know, from a cultural from a cultural perspective inside of my nuclear family and in the next level organization, is more readily embraced. Uncomfortable as it still is, it's okay by virtue of the awareness that the Berkman has brought. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Same on my side, and it's funny, like the feeling included, I think is another point that I've realized. I mean, like we talked about up front, 25 years in some sort of uniform, four years at West Point, 21 years in the military and some of the most elite organizations, right? Um, mm -hmm. One question that the Berkman has made blindingly obvious that I did not ask at any point during my time in uniform was, how do you like to be appreciated? Never asked it. Mm -hmm. And now I'm what I realize I don't have I don't have all access to all five million results, five plus million results of the Berkman, but I have a fairly robust sample size uh, with the clients that I have done it with so far. Mm -hmm. um, and the the vast majority, I'd say close to 80% of all the Berkmans that I've done, people mm -hmm. like to feel appreciated. They may not act like it. If sure. they get, if they get, if they get praised publicly, right. they'll often deflect it to their team or to their partners, whomever, which is a selfless leadership. I'm a fan. You, I think you're a fan, right? That's how we grew up. Mm -hmm. But behind closed doors, just yeah. knowing that we have a chance to win and that, that our boss, our partner, whomever appreciates us. Yeah. And I think, Everyone's a little bit different. I think mm -hmm. a lot of employers would automatically assume it's comp, it's salary, it's stock options, it's equity, whatever. Sometimes it's literally just saying thank you. Yep. Appreciate you. Fist bump. Mm -hmm. Right? It, maybe yep. it's taking them out to lunch once a month and spending some time together. But yep. I, that, is a, that is a question that I embarrassingly now admit that I'd never asked. And yeah. now I, I implore every 
people manager in every organization that I come in contact with just to ask. Yep. Hey, how do you like to feel appreciated? Mm -hmm. Mike Nicole, just, just, I just want to know that I'm along for the ride and your big ass dreams, homie. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> I just want to know that the kids and I are taken into account. But yep. with, without those conversations, how, how do you, what does inclusion feel like to you? How do you like to feel appreciated? Yep. But without me going through the Berkman, I never would have asked it now. And I didn't ask it. Yeah. When I should have. And now mm -hmm. I realized it, my, my error. And now I'm, hopefully paying some of that forward to, to yeah. make other, other, other people wiser than I was. Hell yeah, man. Hell yeah. Well, you know, I, I know for sure that if nothing else, the folks that are listening to this conversation are going to be at the very least intrigued to go discover a little bit more about themselves, not only, you know, how they show up, in their usual behavior and they're at their highest and best, but also what the trick, you know, what the triggers of their stress are and what that manifestation also looks like. So that at the very least, when you realize like what your stress behavior looks like and you can consciously realize that you're in it, now you can reverse engineer the process much to what you've alluded to over the course of this conversation. And just that all by itself is worth its weight in gold because you can now think your way out of a shitty mindset mind state right so you know i really appreciate you taking the time to shed some light on what this crazy four color assessment thing that has tremendous value and has paid tremendous dividends for our clients both at next level and through azimuth um you know you're a busy dude you know, you didn't have to do this. And I'm just grateful for our relationship. I'm grateful for the introduction to the Berkman. And I know that myself, my relationships and my team, my organization are that much better for it, man. Where can our audience get a hold of you, find you, support you, investigate this Berkman with you? Where can they find it? find all that uh so after you stop by next level uh first, then you could always stop by uh, azimuthleadership.com. Uh you you can contact us anyway through there. LinkedIn, K.Scott Morley. Um, you look at this ugly mug uh, on, on the uh, on the profile picture. Um, but anything we could do, because I mean, truly and honestly, uh, we we are about, and I think you are, but you and Nicole are about getting the most, get helping people be at their best, helping people get the most out of themselves, out of their teams. If I can do that, I'm in. Like yep. I actually enjoy watching teams and, and leaders thrive. Yeah. Um, so the better you can do that. I mean, we went, you know, right. Like the amount of errors that you make along the way, learning stuff the hard way yeah. and, and learn to know your team the hard way. If you can just cut that learning curve, even by degrees of percentage, like it's, mm. it, it's, it's rewarding to me to do yeah. that. So Check out azimuthleadership.com, reach out, LinkedIn. Uh, but if I can help uh, bring out the best in you or your team, I actually enjoy it. And I, and I think it's an honor. So appreciate you. Appreciate Nicole, brother. Keep doing what you're doing. Hey, man. You're making a much appreciate. Thank you, dude. Thank you. Same. Re re reciprocate that, that sentiment 100%. You know, for everybody out there, remember, it's all about making yourself a priority, eliminating that stress and creating alignment. So if Next Level can facilitate that, Click the link below. Check out our sponsors. We got a lot to lot of lot to offer and a lot of value to present. And as always, progress always.